Shutters. Good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Welcome to another episode of Black College Experience. My name is Derek Thomas, and I'm in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I have on with me my co-host and founder of Black College Experience, the one and only Keisha Kelly. What's going on, Kels? Hi, everybody. Yes, indeed. It has been an awesome weekend of HBCU sports action, culminating in a Black College National Champion being crowned. Uh, We got basketball action. Um, We're going to have a guest, Coach Thomas Billis of Tougaloo College, uh, a well-known and championship-winning coach at the high school level. We've been in charge of rebuilding that Tougaloo College Bulldog program. And they're off to a tremendous start this year. So um, I, I got a chance to get Coach Bill to come on. He agreed, so I can't wait to get him on. And we can talk about how he's transitioning uh, from coaching high school to college. But, Kels, Kels, we know what everybody yeah. wants to talk about tonight before we have Coach Billups coming on in about 25 minutes. The celebration vote. Uh, the game of games in HBCU football between the Alcorn State Braves and the North Carolina's a and Aggies. Kels, you were on hand for that game. So, you know, before we, you know, I know PP's probably going to call in where we can recap the game. But let's just talk about the atmosphere of the Celebration Bowl. You were there to witness it firsthand. Uh, you, you hobnobbing with all the HBCU celebrities, including the good buddy, the, uh, uh, the Celebration Bowl boss, Mr. Grant. So just talk to our listeners about the Celebration Bowl's atmosphere and your experience. <laughs> Uh, Celebration Bowl, this is my fourth uh, Celebration Bowl I have not missed. For people that don't know, I'm going to say it anyway. Celebration Bowl is always around my birthday. Yesterday was my birthday. So I spent my day doing Celebration Bowl in the beginning of my birthday. Wouldn't change any of that for the world because it's what I love to do. So I did. I saw the happy Celebration Bowl day is what you said. I saw that and I laughed. And I was like, that's what I get. That's it's so funny. I, I share my birthday with Celebration Bowl. But it was. It, it was one of the most, um, it, you know, it was one of the, the one of the best atmospheres. It started off chilly, but it, it did calm down. It got warmer, um, I guess, like during the or warmer towards you know, the middle of the day. But um, just looking at it, um, you know, it was the situation of, um, you know, 31,672 was the attendance on yesterday. Um, very, very, very good crowd for both teams, both Alcorn and for North Carolina a and um, Both sidelines, uh, just a lot of energy. Very, very, just very energetic. Um, again, I did get a chance to talk to the commissioner. Got a chance to talk to the MEAC commissioner, the SWAC commissioner, yeah. the former interim SWAC commissioner. Um also got a chance to talk to Jasher. For people that don't know, Jasher is associate AD out at uh, Tuskegee, and Jasher used to be in the SWAC office. Now, he was there at the time when Dewar was there, so that was his term. Right. So I did get a chance to talk to him, which, you know, one of my closest friends. I talked to Jasher as well, but it was it was just a great experience. Um, just being there, seeing all of those people and so many people out there, uh, so many people traveled from both, uh, you know, for Alcorn and for North Carolina A and T, it was just a lot of high, high speed, high momentum. And no matter what team you were going for on yesterday, just to to see, you know, th- this many people in one building supporting HBCU athletics on yesterday was the most important thing. And I just need people to know, you know, FCS, FBS, this this here, FCS bowl game beat out. FBS bowl game. This was the this one here was ranked second in attendance of a bowl game yesterday. Right under oh. Las Vegas. Right. So you know when people are saying, "Oh, that's all you get," and I'm looking like, "Okay, well we're we're out beating some other teams," and so to see that was was a great thing, and we were looking for the highlights, and it did get the ticker today on you know on Sports Center. I was looking for highlights, didn't get it, but it, it was it was a again it was a great game. Um, Sidelines was was really just it, it was it was just really great to be in the building. Yes, indeed, and you know I, I really liked how you were promoting the other HBCU outlets, uh, individuals that we work hand in hand with, uh, 
and some individuals that we have not maybe worked hand in hand with because we are HBCU family. You know, we, we don't, I don't really look at us as competing outlets because we all have the goal right. of promoting HBCU athletics. And it's more so like a family. I mean, any, any one right. of those guys that I've asked questions from, for me, I'm a rookie in this still. They've given me advice and guidance. And, and, and if no one's going to promote us but us, and that's been, that's been one of your central messages, you know what I'm saying, is that's our duty to provide coverage for our for our schools for our sports when no one else will so and that's what we do now to get down to the nitty-gritty kills this was an amazing game i mean sitting at home watching i, I called it, it was 7-0 north carolina nt when i turned on to the game i missed that first touchdown by zachary leslie from lamar reynard it was a, it was a 17 yard pass and that gave north carolina nt the lead um I picked Alcorn to win this game, um, but unfortunately, our Braves fell short. Our Braves, our swag champion Braves fell short. But the recap, it was an exciting game. You know, Alcorn got on the board with a 29-yard field goal from Corey McCullough, so that made the game 7-3. to three. And then uh, North Carolina NT started to score in the second quarter with a 36-yard field goal, and that followed up a 27-yard touchdown pass from Raynard to Elijah Bell. And then Alcorn finally decided to get rolling, crunking up, and come out and get on the warpath because we all know how the Alcorn offense can get rolling, Kels. I mean, I did not expect the North Carolina anti defense to be able to stagnate the Braves offense for four quarters. They stagnated them in the first half. But then that Alcorn, I called it a three-headed monster. It was a two-headed monster and Noah Johnson – and uh, Deshaun Waller uh, helping the Braves get back into this game. Waller burst up the middle for, I think, an 82-yard game. Um, and then you know, Noah Johnson on the next drive finished it off with a 30-yard run to bring Alcorn within 17 to 13. Um, McCullough kicked another field goal, and that brought Alcorn um, within one, 17 to 16. What happened next, Kels, changed this game. Because Alcorn had the momentum. I mean, for not being able to score much or have much offensive output in the first half because Alcorn's rushing attack was stagnant. They actually threw the ball more than they ran it. And North Carolina T wasn't respecting the passing game of Alcorn because we all know what Alcorn has done all year long. And offensively, they have run it down people's throats. So, Coach McNair tried to use some of that air magic throwing the ball to kind of keep North Carolina NT off base, but that didn't work as they shut Alcorn down in the rushing game and, and, and gave up some games in the air, but it wasn't enough to get the Alcorn rolling. But Noah Johnson and Waller uh, got the Braves offense rolling. Uh, after that touchdown, like I said, McCullough kicked the field goal. And then Malik Wilson, after that field goal kills, Talk about the excitement before the kickoff return. The bands were playing. Uh, Alcorn was playing that song. I hate for them to play, but I was glad it was playing because that meant the Braves were back in this game. Talk about the atmosphere before that kickoff return. Well, you know, at, at this point when, when Alcorn scores, everyone's excited, everyone is, is turned up and Everyone's excited, and, and it's, it's nothing but noise on Alcorn's side. It's, it's a defeat and quietness on North Carolina a and side. And at this time, I was actually standing on Alcorn's side. And right at that moment, it's, it's, I don't know, it was, it's almost like winning something and someone taking it from you. The very next possession was of North Carolina a and <laughs> It's a touchdown. So, you know, it, it – I, again, I, I said this earlier, and I and I, I was very clear, and I meant it because I've read some tweets, I read some stuff. I, I I'm not a biased person when it comes to conflict. I'm not. I'm just not. I don't care. I, I'm just not. And I read some of the stuff on why somebody would, why somebody shouldn't, how they could, how they couldn't. At the end of the day, if you ask a, a, a expert. They're not going to give it to you analytical. They're going to give it to you WAL. So in the end, North Carolina a and still walked away with the W. Right. But, you know, when that kickoff 
return happened. I mean, I was watching it from my from my recliner, you know, from home, and seeing him break through. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, he gone. And as he el- elu- eluded the last Alcorn possible tackler, you knew he was gone, and that. Was all well, all corn looked like what well, you know. The first half, they 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 didn't. They just couldn't stop the run. The first half, all corn. It just the A and T held in the first half. The second half was all all corn. Exactly. Everything yeah, all-, all corn could do, they did. They looked really good in the second half. So I'm thinking, okay, they're coming back. They're coming back. I thought they were actually coming back. I'm thinking they're coming back and. You know, they, they do. And then they, they there was a couple of touchdowns. And I'm like, okay, but even in running the last couple of minutes on the clock, I didn't even see that counting down. I just see everybody rushing the field because I think I had my back turned and I was still waiting on them to score again. And then the right. clock just started ticking down. And I was like, well, okay. Right now, I have my line brother on the phone, Patrick Perry, PP. We haven't talked about the yeah. end of the game yet, but <clears throat> up until now. <clears throat> With Alcorn giving up that kickoff return for North Carolina and T to get the momentum back, talk about your analysis of the Celebration Bowl based off what you predicted because you felt Alcorn was going to win as well, right? <clears throat> yeah, uh, I mean, Alcorn did everything I thought they were going to do itself. The most important thing, win. Oh, it was one thing that I didn't expect them to do. That was they pretty much – Said okay, we gonna a and t. We gonna run this ball down your throat, and you can't do nothing about it. And man, they did. It. <laughs> I'm talking about they did it. Uh, they did it more than FBS teams have done against a and t. And they just all one only made one mistake in the second half, and that's what cost them the game. What? And what, and what mistake was that? The kickoff. <laughs> oh yeah, the kickoff return. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was a big mistake. Yes, you're right. And but even with that, Alcorn still had a chance to win the game. You know, uh, with a touchdown run by Noah Johnson, 59 yards. I mean, when that Alcorn rushing tag got crumped, it got crumped. Uh, Deshaun Waller had 19 carries for 167 yards, along with 54. Noah Johnson had 14 carries for 120 yards and two touchdowns. You know, uh, for North Carolina T. Raynard. Uh, was the MVP and player of the game, 292 yards and two touchdowns, one interception. The rushing of hat for North Carolina NT was shut down. Only 38 yards on 31 carries. Rock Cartwright, Markel Cartwright, um, was shut down. The leading rusher was Jermaine Martin with 10 carries for 31 yards. So that all corn defense was able to shut North Carolina's A&T's rushing attack down, but right now I hurt them through the air. Uh, all corn. Did score late with Noah Johnson rushing for that last touchdown. But we're getting ready to talk about the crucial play. And the most crucial play in this game was the two-point conversion. A lot of fans said Alcorn shouldn't have went for two. They said they should have kicked the extra point. Well, I think it was the right decision to go for two to tie the game because if you go for the one, you're still down 24-23. You still have to score a point. North Carolina and T still has the lead. They have to run down the clock, and you got overtime. So, this two-point conversion play, Kels, let's have your analysis of that final decision and then the outcome of that play from your point of view. Well, that you know, it, it's, it's still it's controversy on that, too, because what they're saying is is that, you know, that it, that it should have counted, that it was a catch is what they were saying. Again, like I tell people, and – you know, people don't have to agree with it. You're watching it from home. You're watching it from the stands versus watching it from the sideline. It's three different views. So, you know, in the end, it's, I say this, and this is what I'll leave it at. You never leave a game in the hand of a referee. You just exactly. can't. Like, you just can't. Because when you leave it in their hands, they, you don't know what you're going to get, especially with these referees. You don't know what you're going to get. But, again, they, you know, it was it was probably one of the – Oh my God! It's probably one of the better games that I have saw. Again, right. I, I I just saw Alcorn coming back somewhere, and it just didn't happen. Exactly, PP. Your analysis and opinion on that final play? I thought that was a because he caught he had possession of the ball when he stumped his two feet in. Then the player knocked the ball. Well, kind of just with the ball loose from him, but he didn't never. What is it? You supposed to complete the process. 
he completed the process out of bounds, you know. He, the ball didn't touch the ground. He came up with the ball in his possession, you know. But the most important part is if he had possession of the ball before he went out of bounds. And mm-hmm. in my opinion, I think he did because just as when he went out of bounds, the A&T player knocked the ball, well, kind of juggled the ball loose from him. And then he rolled out of bounds. Well, here is my opinion on this. And he does possess the ball in bounds. And then he goes out of bounds. And then he loses possession of the ball. What is a catch? The NFL has been having this issue since Des Bryant's goal line catch, none catch. Now this is trickling down to college football. You know, um, we're going to have to look at this a little closer. Initially, yes, I did agree that it was a catch because the rule states possession of the ball, feet down. And then he goes out of bounds, and then he loses lose possession of the ball. So, I mean, I'm not a football catch guru. I played offensive lineman. I, we didn't have to catch no ball. All we did was block and knock people over. But from my point of view, I did think it was a catch. But from the official point of view, with him losing possession of the ball, they ruled it not a catch. So maybe we need to revamp the rules. If you have possession of the ball inbounds, then as you're out of bounds, if you lose possession, because that does that really not make it a catch? Because that's a crucial play. That ties the game. And it's possible that we go to overtime to, to, to determine the black college national champion. But unfortunately, North Carolina a t escapes with a 24-23 victory. Claiming that trophy for the second straight year, Lamar Raynard, you know, is a national champion. Uh, a Valley alum is a national champion his first year um, as the head coach of North Carolina T, Coach Washington. And I, I know I'm proud because he's a Valley alum. Even though we're not winning ourselves, our alums are winning. So I'm happy about that. So, Kels, after the game was over, what was the atmosphere like uh from all corn fans and North Carolina AT fans alike. Well, you know, everybody just kind of stayed in the, you know, everybody stayed in the, uh, stayed in the stadium and they watched or they waited for everybody to march out, waited for uh, uh, Towns of Dynamite to march out and then um, as well as uh, A&T's band to march out. And so, it was, you know, it was pretty good camaraderie. I mean, of course, you know, the game was so early. So, you know, it's just time adjusting. You're trying to adjust to the time and, you know, doing post game and, trying to get to the back. But, you know, just being presented the trophy, uh, Coach Washington, you know, you can see it in his face. And, you know, just hearing the athletes on the side, I can hear them saying, hey, man, it's all about me, I can eat the swag. I, you know, I can hear it, but, you know, kids going to be kids, and you're just like, whatever. So at the end of the day, you know, it, it was it was just a – it was a good good thing for them. But, um, again, you can, you just can't take anything from Alcorn. They, they did. They played really well. And once they got started in the second half, it was, like I said, it was all them. It was it was all Alcorn. Right. They, they, they played back. really, really well. Yeah, they, they did. They, they did played really well. So a two-point loss isn't, you know, it's a loss, but it's not like they they got blew out. It's not like they right. got blew out. Well, it looked like it was going to be an ugly game going in the half with a 17-6 to six lead and Alcorn offense unable right. to mount any type of – Offensive. Right, two field goals. Yeah, two Correct. field goals, the rushing attack struggling, the passing attack struggling, you know, and then, you know, later in the game, Noah Johnson had an injury that really that really affected his effectiveness in the all corn offense in the fourth quarter. You know, I mean, he wasn't – after that 59-yard run, um, I think he came up injured, got treatment. When he was rolling out, you could see later on in the next drive, when he was trying to roll out – he didn't really want to throw the ball. He wanted to take off and run because he had open field. But the injury, uh, I guess, permitted you know prevented him from taking advantage of his natural running ability. So you know um, he left it out there on the field. You know he gutted it right, out as best he could. Let's take a commercial break before coach comes on. All right, we're gonna take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back with more Black College Experience in thirty-one seconds. I already knew that I was going to go to college, you know, from a young age. I definitely want to major in political science. After that, I'm going to get my law degree. Then I'm going to come back to Detroit, boost the economy, become the mayor or something, try to make the situation better for other people. I feel like I owe it to the city. I'm determined. It's, it, it's going to happen. 
My name is Justin, and I am your dividend. All right, we're back with more Black College Experience, and we're just recapping the end of the Celebration Bowl and, you know, just culminating another awesome season of HBCU football. And now we have our prospects getting ready for their postseason games, getting ready for the NFL draft, uh, trying to carve out professional careers in the NFL, the Canadian Football League, and the two other professional football leagues that are going to be starting up soon. So it's going to be exciting to see where some of our top prospects end up across the HBCU landscape. And, you know, one of my favorite players is, is, is Amir Hall. And, you know, uh, he didn't win the Harlem Hill Trophy, came in fourth, but he still has one more trophy he's up, he's up for. Um, which hopefully he'll win. But, you know, it's just an exciting time. Speaking of HBCU players in the NFL, Kels, I know you posted her about it, but you saw that shutout led by Darius Leonard and the Indianapolis coach, right? I, I did, and, you know, <laughs> I, I saw you talking about it. And the funny thing is, like I said, we were on the sidelines yesterday and I was talking to a couple of uh, North Carolina Central alums, and they were talking about him. And we were just talking about, you know, how, like, what a great player he is. And we were also talking about how, you know, all these guys are going up for Pro Bowl and all these guys, what they're doing from HBCUs. And just to see, like, his name keeps surfacing, and he every right. week he continues to get better. So, you know, to say that you're a rookie – and, and you're doing this much, um, it, it, it is. It just speaks volumes. And then you you even look at Tariq Cohen. Tariq is just getting better over the season. And, you know, you see that, you know, of course, they, they eliminated the Packers today, the Bears did. So, you know, just looking at these teams and these HBCUs, of course, Chester's over there in Indianapolis as well. So, you know, week by week, these HBCU players are putting up numbers and just defensively just doing what they need to do. And all they needed really was a change. Exactly, and I'm trying to get those stats pulled up here, you know, because it was an amazing game that the coach defense had led by Darius Leonard, you know, the maniac as he's called. And I think he had about 11 tackles. I'm talking about just all over the field, you know, all over the field just destroying that coach defense offense. I'm sorry, that Cowboys offense and – and I do have his stats here. Yes, he had 11, 11 tackles, nine solo, one tackle for loss, and two passes defense. So it's a good game for an HBCU product, you know. I mean, when you have someone like him who, you know, uh, shows that he belongs on that football field, I mean, you can't take nothing away from him. I mean, he's a leading tackler in the NFL as a rookie. So really, he could end up being the defensive player of the year and the NFL Defensive Rookie of the Year. And Tariq Hohen, he had five carries for 21 yards. And through the air, he had five catches for 31 yards and a touchdown. So, and he also had, um, he, he did have a fumble, but that touchdown makes up for that fumble. So, HBCU athletes doing it big. And I did just hear a ding. And that is our guest of honor. And the one and only, uh, our guest tonight is Coach Thomas Billups of Tougaloo College. Coach Billups, how you doing? Oh yeah, I'm good. How you doing? Yes, I'm doing. I'm doing great, Coach Billups. And just to let everyone know, this is one of the most legendary high school coaches in the state of Mississippi. I got a chance to see him coach uh, over my young life. What he did at Lanier. Uh, it, in Jackson, everybody was tired of y'all winning, but you, you you did it. You know, you you went to thirteen state championships and won eight. You put a number of players uh, in college and in the NBA. But in your bio, I learned a lot about uh, you uh, as far as what you did before Lanier, because I I always thought you was at Lanier forever. But to find out that you started out in Vicksburg. And you won titles at every level you coached in Vicksburg. Um, it's it's just it's just it just shows you the amount of excellence that you've had over your over your career. And we know you're going to do the same thing at Tougaloo. Well, you know, I'm that's what I'm. You know, I'm building over at Tougaloo, and uh, uh, I'm, you know, that's what I'm doing. That's why I worked so hard to put that team together, and. and do the same thing like I did at Lanier and Vicksburg. 
Yes, indeed. So now, um, now you also a graduate of Jackson State, correct? Two time graduate of Jackson State. Yeah, I got my. Yeah, I got my masters. I graduated, got my BS and masters from Jackson State University. Yes, did you did you play basketball for Jackson State? I played football at played Jackson football. State. Okay, yeah, because yeah, of course that was before, you know before, yeah I, that I played anybody. football. Yeah, but I played. I went to a junior college. I went to East Central Junior College, where I played football. I was the first black quarterback at East Central Junior College. Oh wow! Uh, we went on and won the North half, and I was the first black quarterback, and I played football and baseball. I have a record at uh, East Central for the most strikeouts at that time with 23 strikeouts per game, uh, in a game. You know. Yes, indeed. See, you learn something different. Like, I, I, I knew you were a legendary basketball coach, but to find out that you were a trailblazer in football and also baseball, and that just shows that anyone who is an honest of you, a player of you, needs to listen. I mean, over my young life watching you coach, everyone knows that, that Billups' fiery demeanor and a lot of coaches say, oh, Coach Billups is me. No, Coach Billups is not me. He's just coaching you hard. And when you have someone who has such a fiery demeanor, you've won at every level. So that's just your competitor spirit coming out, right? See, what people don't understand is that if my son, I coach my own son. Yeah. And I coach my daughter also. Uh, and I coach them the same way that I coach the other kids, the other players that at Lanier. And I was just as hard on him than I was them. Probably was harder because my wife always tell me, you, you know, kind of lighten up on him. You're a little harder on him than you is the rest of them. But, you know, I wanted to bring the best out of all of them. And that's just the way I do it. But, you know, like you say, uh, People think that that's just one side that they see, that me on the sideline. Right. But you can go back from the time that I started coaching, and any kid that I coached that needed something. Oh, you took care of them. Or from a one-parent home that didn't have much. Some of them didn't have shoes. Some of them didn't have, you know, Pants to wear, and my me and my wife would go out and buy it for them. And my kids never, wherever we went, it didn't matter if we went from Jackson to Ken, Mississippi. If you know, when we go out, we gonna play hard every night. We hit the floor, and and my kids are not my players. Is not gonna come back home without our freedom. It don't matter if I have to spend my own money. Sometimes that, you know, sometimes your your school won't give you money to feed them when you're just going 15 or 20 miles. But, man, when they go with me, I'm going to feed them if I don't take them but eight miles. If they play, they're going to eat. Yes, and then now that I did know about. Everyone knows when, coach, when you coach by Coach Billups, you're not just a basketball coach to them. You're also a father figure. And I, I went to school with Shaughnessy, so I definitely know her very well. I didn't get a chance to go to school with TJ, but I, I, I saw him play. I, I had a chance to witness firsthand your greatness uh, over the years at Lanier. And um, I, know I, I know I was shocked to see you leave there. But, you know, you're at a place now uh, following behind two other HBCU coaching legends that I know, Coach Dribbles and Coach Wardell, who coached at Mississippi Valley. Now you're taking up the, the mantle at Tougaloo. And you're building that team uh, into a, a, a winner, right? now. I think y'all are ten and two on the season, getting ready to uh, head into GCAC play. Yeah, we ten and two, and yeah, you're right. Getting ready to head into our conference and hope that you know everybody uh, come out okay with the, you know with the grade for the first semester. Hope that we don't lose anybody and and. You know, I think we're going to be okay. Like you said, we're 10 and 2 right now. And we uh getting ready to get into our conference. So, you know, 
hopefully we done played enough game to correct, you know, most of our mistakes. And we'll look, go back and look over films and try to correct people on what they need to do to make us better. Yes, indeed. Kels, you have any questions for Coach? Okay. Tell us about the transition, your transition from one level to the next. So how did the transition into coaching for college and what that has been like for you? Let me, let me just say this, and then I'm going to answer that. You okay. know, that's what I put in a lot of applications mm-hmm. to different schools that mm-hmm. had an opening, especially our black HBCU. Mm-hmm. I put in a, I put in an application. I put two applications in at Valley for the head coaching job when it came over. I put oh, two in oh, for Jackson man. State. I put two in for Jackson State when they had a coaching you know, where they were looking for a basketball coach. And I put one in from Alcorn. And guess what all of them told me? That I needed some college experience. No. Now, let me answer your question. Let me answer <laughs> your question that you asked me. If you know basketball, you don't need no college experience. I, it's the only thing different from high school to college is recruiting. That's the only right. thing different. Other than that, I coach the same way. I do everything the same way. You know, I have to go out and recruit. But that's the only difference for me now. I don't know about the other coaches, and, you know, every coach don't coach like I do, uh, you know. I can't believe that. I'm, I'm upset. <laughs> I, I'm upset hey, over hey. in tears. And both, both of the Valley alums on the phone, like, wait, what? Both, I mean, both and, of y'all sounded the yeah, same. And yeah, listen, and listen to this: why they, why they listening on the phone, Valley? And you know what? I just beat Valley the other uh, about a month ago. <laughs> he did. And they did. Jack- <laughs> and I played Jackson State, beat them by twenty-one when I first got to. Uh, oh, I remember that whoo, game. Tougaloo. I, I remember that. Yeah, I remember that game. Beat, up. Played all corn. Played all corn. Went three overtime with them. And you know those swag referees wasn't going to let a little school like Tougaloo come down there and beat Alcorn. Went to Southern and Hattiesburg, you know, down at Hattiesburg. Mm-hmm. Played them to overtime. They took the game from me down there. Yes, indeed. Now, that's one so, thing. You, you know. When you coaching against a Tom ahead, Billups team, when you coach against a Tom Billups team, they're not going to quit. And – and what you're saying is just the epitome of what I saw you saw because I haven't had a chance to witness any of your games and, uh, as a as a as a college coach. But I know how your high school teams played. Um, no one wanted to face Lanier. Y'all were feared, and I and I think you're going to do the same thing or two. Go ahead, coach. Yeah, we we gonna you know uh, just give me a little more time. You know, I'm not asking for two or three or four or five years, but since I've been there, we. We done got better since I've been there. We done beat the number one team in the nation in our conference, the number two, the number seven, and the number 11 team. So, you know, we coming on every year strong. Last year I won 16 games, and and I was the – and I coached by myself last year. I didn't have no assistant coach last year. So, you know, this year we just had it season, and I done won 10 games already. So hopefully that we can get better and better and we'll win 20 to 25 games this year. That's what, that's my goal. Yes, indeed. Now, see, I see I, I'm, I'm ready to find what, out who what is your Uber. Go ahead, Kels. No, I was just going to ask, what was what is your recruiting like? How do you recruit? Do you have a, a certain method to your recruiting? Is there a certain way you recruit, certain places you go? How do you go about your personal recruiting? Well, let me just tell you this, and I'm just tell you how how I am about my work, my coaching. I don't even have a a coaching. I mean, I don't even have a recruiting budget at Tougaloo. I use my own money. I use my own money to recruit. But when I'm out recruiting, it's one thing I don't do. First thing I tell them to do is Google me. Google every school I've been to and 
you know, after they do that, and I tell them, I'm going to tell you the truth about everything. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm tough on you, but it's tough love. Exactly. And, but because I want you to be successful, and the main thing I tell them, we're going to get grades first before we do anything. We're going to pass our class, and we're going to class first. And then we're going to deal with basketball. And, you know, and, you know, I want them, when people look back and, and bring my name up, I want them to know that I cared about all the kids that I coached. It doesn't matter what level they was on because I wanted them to be successful. And most of my kids that I have coached in high school and in college over there at Tougaloo, most of them has got good jobs. Most of them, about 10 is overseas playing basketball, and I had three in the NBA. Mm-hmm. So, and you know, I'm not just – be in the NBA, Darius Rice. Right, right. And, you know, I want to make men out of these guys. You know, that's what I coach for. Yes, indeed. Now, um, speaking of your uh, your current team, you have a player on your team that's right now, I think, leading the conference and scoring and rebounding. And that, that is Tanzel Handy. Talk about how you've helped mold him since he's gotten uh, to Tougaloo from East Central. How you well, him you know, let me just, is. yeah. Okay, let me just go back. When I was at Lanier, see, uh, this, this, this is something else that a lot of people don't understand either. Uh, when I was at Lanier, Tanzea Handy was a 10th grader. He wasn't even playing basketball. He was in my physical ed class. So I saw him playing out there with the guys one day and and I told him to, you know, hey, I told him to come on out and work with us and succeed, and let's see, can you know, see, can you make my team? He came out, and uh, he came out and started practicing, and, and, you know, he didn't know a lot. He learned the plays and everything, and uh, about the fifth game of the season, he was a 10th grader, and he was starting – the sixth game of our season as a 10th grader. And we, you know, and I left and went to Oak Grove and coached down there for a year. Right. And when I came back to Tougaloo, he signed with me from Tougaloo. I mean, from Lanier. He signed with me from Lanier. And his grades wasn't right, so I sent him on to East Central. That's where I went to school there. Uh, so after I got him from from East Central, you know, I brought him in and, you know, sitting down and talk with him. And he already knew what I expected of him oh, because yeah. I coached him a year at high in uh, Lanier. So he was telling all the other guys and kind of telling them, say, hey, man, we got to do this because Coach ain't going to go for that. Hey, he's going to work us hard and he's going to get the best out of us. And, and so, but Hannah fell into – he followed the, the footsteps of all those other guys that went through the deal, and he knew what it was going to be like. And when he, when he came on to Tougaloo, he just fell in, in the right – you know, everything was just fell in for him. So he already knew. Right. He knew your message. So, but right now, yeah, right now, this kid him, he might be the best kid. I'm talking about 12. He might be the best player in the SWAT and uh, what is that, USA? He might be the player in the, at, I'm talking about Southern University Conference. Uh-huh. He might be the best player in those two conferences. He's averaging the other night. Last night he scored 25 points and had yeah. 25 rebounds and seven assists. And if he hadn't missed the free throws, he probably would have scored 40. He missed oh, yeah. eight free throws. He did. It was nine for eight. Yeah. And I, mean, I have to, you know, 
and and the, about this kid here, he he probably played most of the game. Only time I bring him out is when he got in. He might be in foul trouble, but when I asked him, "Is he okay?" You know, I'm not gonna bring him out if he if he okay. But when he gets tired, I bring him out and give him a little break, and then I get him back in. And and he he go full speed every trip on defense and offense. And I'm the type of player that's gonna make it, you know, because they work so hard. And that's what my mom and dad always instilled in me that when you work hard, good things gonna happen for you. Exactly. Now I'm looking at your roster, and I, and being that you know you coached uh, Tunzel in high school, uh, did you coach Derek Ashley when he was at Oak Grove as well? Yeah, I coached Derek Ashley when he was at Oak Grove. So he that was another one knew what I wanted, and you know he knew how I coach, and he knew that I was one of the coaches that most players couldn't play for unless they was tough. Mm-hmm. You know, I coached I coached some some players that didn't even have a lot of ability, but they knew what I wanted. They knew I wanted them to play hard defense, and they played so hard for me. And, and you know, they became good players. That's correct. Now, uh, I want to I want to piggyback off of Kells a little bit with you saying you don't have with your recruiting. So you know. With me being from Jackson, I, I grew up on Tougaloo's campus at, uh, at NYSP. Did you ever participate uh, or coach at the NYSP during the summer? You know what? You, you During that time, you probably saw me over there. Yeah. I worked about seven years, and that's just how hard I worked. I worked seven years at Tougaloo in the NYSP program mm-hmm. from – Seven o'clock to twelve o'clock. From twelve o'clock to five o'clock, I came to Jackson State and ran mostly ran their program over there, NYSB. Yeah, so I, I so for- I was I was I saw it work at seven o'clock and then stopped to five thirty or six. Right, and I grew up on that campus, going to NYSP, and and we, and I also attended science camps at Tugu, so I understand. You know, Tougaloo is mostly known for its academics. You know, uh, one re- one of the reasons why I didn't go to Tougaloo for college is because I-, I thought I was going to end up playing college football somewhere. Unfortunately, I didn't play football at Valley. I tried, but I didn't. I, I got hurt trying to walk on. But, you know, mm-hmm. talk about, you know, finding kids to have the academics uh, to get into Tougaloo. And also the the struggles as far as what type of scholarships do you have to offer? Are they full scholarships? Because me and PP can tell you, uh, as far as recruiting at Valley, we know we have a problems offering a full amount of scholarships as well. So talk to us about you know getting players there that can that can keep the grades with the rigorous academics that I know Tougaloo has. Yeah. Well, what we do. Uh, it's not a, 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 a big thing on getting them in. And let me just tell you how we get them in, what they have to have to get in. But the hardest part is, is to stay in when you get there. Mm. Because it's really tough in academic. And they really, you know, you're going to have to have, you're going to have to study and you're going to have to have your man ready at Tougaloo. Now, the way we get them in, we have three things. You can make a 17 on your ACT test. You can graduate in the 50th percentile of your class. And you can have an overall two-point grade point average. So we'll take two of those and we can get you in. But just like I said, getting you in, the hardest part is keeping you there. Right. Yeah, because it's really tough in the academic, and you're going to have to really, really study. But we've been so lucky since I've been there. This going on my fifth year, and I done graduated 16 of them. Now, what about scholarships? What type of – Okay, my scholarships deal, we got got 10 scholarships, and we 
we don't give full scholarship unless that you run up on a player like Tunzel Handy. Mm-hmm. And if if he don't get Pell Grant, if he don't get a Pell Grant, uh, then a player like Tunzel Handy, I have to give him a full scholarship. But most of the players that I do get, they get Pell. And what we do, we give them, they get their Pell back, and then we give them the scholarship. We give them the remaining of it by scholarship. Mm-hmm. So um, now with Tougaloo being in the Jackson metro area, you have, of course, you know the Jackson high school area better than any coach in the area. Talk about some of the players. Do they still want to come play for Coach Billups? Uh, well, you know what? I have <laughs> I have so many people calling me, but, you know, just the way it works, man. Uh, I've been like I started off in Vicksburg. Mm-hmm. I coached some great players there. Phelps that was in the NBA also. You know he went to Alcorn, but he got drafted after he left me. Uh, when you coach a lot of players and you coach at different places, those players that I coached a long time ago, you know they're gonna have sons, they're gonna have uncles, they're gonna have you know, stepdaddies and stuff, and and those guys always calling me, telling me, Coach, we got, I got a player for you. I'm talking about from Vicksburg, Jackson, uh, Hattiesburg, and even from my hometown, Louisville. I got some, my high school classmates always looking for players for me. So right. that's how I run up on a lot of players. And like my son right now, he's coaching – in Dallas, in Texas, and he, you know, I coached him. And right now, his team is the number one four A team in the state of Texas. Like father, like son. Yep, and and uh, you know, and his team right now is twelve and two, and he doesn't beat six A teams, five A teams, and won a couple tournaments up there. And, 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 you know, uh, it's, you know, I have a lot of time. I have a lot of chances to leave Lanier and go to a, a be an assistant at a D1 school. Mm-hmm. But I chose to stay at Lanier because they wasn't going to pay me no more than I'm making up at Lanier for an assistant coach. And I have a chance to coach my daughter and my son and my other son, Cramner. Well, a lot of people don't know him because he didn't hardly stay with us that much. But he done won three state championships at Newton High School. And he won a state championship in junior college at East Central Junior College. Wow. So my kid has been around me so and all of them, like Shaughnessy, now she's a counselor in Starkville. Yeah, and your son-in-law is a good football coach, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Chris is one of the best uh, high school coaches in the country. I mean, he is, hey, he is brilliant, you know. And and I always tell them, guys, hey, I always tell them if you work hard, don't worry about nothing. If you work hard and you, you, you hey, and you can get some kids to work hard, you're going to win. Right. You're going to win. No. And don't get in it. And don't get in it just for the money. I mean, you know, we got to make money too, but, you know, if you're going to get in making money, you got to win. If you don't, you won't stay there. And this, in, in this business called coaches get fired every day. Exactly. And you're right. You're right about that. Now, um, now, of course, with Tougaloo being uh, in AIA, you know, uh, we do know, I'm, I'm pretty sure some of these young men have professional basketball aspirations. So, you know, what kind of advice do you give these young men? Because, of course, most, a lot of NBA scouts may not come through Tougaloo's doors because of the level we play at. But the type of coaching that your guys are getting, the fundamentals that you're teaching them, are definitely going to help them carve out professional careers uh, overseas, in the G League, and potentially work their way to the NBA? 
Yeah. But what I do is, what I do about that, see, and for the example, uh, Tanzel Handy, you know, I know good players when I see them, and I know overseas players when I see them, and I know NBA players. It's just like when I saw, when I first got Monte and, oh, yeah. and Charles Rose and, you know, those guys, I knew they was going to be NBA players. And right now, I you know, I see that in Tanzel Handy right now. He's going to be an NBA player, but I'm going to put his name in the draft. I mean, you know, he might not get drafted, but I'm going to put it in there. Because, so you, you you know, a lot of those players that in the NBA a long time ago uh, that played in AIA, they got drafted. They played in the NBA. And that's another thing that helped me recruit also. I let those kids, I let those kids see – Hey, you know, all kids want to go to a D1 school, but you don't have to go to D1 to make it big time or go to the NBA because there's a lot of players. I got about 75 players that played in NAIA that played in the NBA. And I let them know if you come there, you work hard, you got a chance to do it. But now you got to work hard and you got to be coachable. Yes, indeed. You got to be coachable. Not and correct. like I said, I'm going to put a handy name out there. I'm going to put it in the overseas draft. I'm gonna, well, I'm going to put it in the overseas. I got a little connection. I'll call, let them come in and see him play. And, and you know, most of the kids in NAIA, you know, they'll have to travel to to that site, wherever right. they have in that workout, so in order for them to look at them. So, that's, you know, when the season is over, that's what we're going to start looking at. Yes, indeed. And we're running out of time. Coach Kells, you have anything more for Coach Billups? I have anything, though. Well, Coach Billups, I'm thankful that you found time tonight to call us and call in and talk about your program and talk about your origins as a, as a basketball coach and just, just to bestow some of that Billups knowledge on, on us. I'm, I'm still shocked that, that Alcorn, Jack State, and Valley – um, didn't take you as a coach. You don't turn someone down with your winning way, with your winning pedigree. And that is one thing that can always be associated with you from what I know of you. And and I've known of you ever since I was a little kid. And one thing about you, you've always been successful. Uh, you've always won and you've always been a good coach and father figure for your players. And when you have someone that puts that much back into your players, that's going to make them players want to play hard for you. And, and that is one thing, you know, uh, I didn't, that is one thing that I know when you face the Thomas Billups basketball team is they ain't going to quit because the way you coach, you will your players to not quit. And um, I, now that you called in and been a guest on Black College Experience, I mean, anytime you're free on a Sunday night, when you want to call and talk basketball during the basketball season, or since I now know that you were a football player in HBCU, you a Jack State Tiger, y'all got a new head coach and Coach Henry. If you want to call in and talk about HBCU football, man, feel free to call in anytime. And I'm going to try to come make it to a game so I can uh, – probably when you see me, you probably going to recognize me. You had not seen me in a long time, but I, I actually met you a, a long time ago. Uh, but yeah. every little kid that grew up in Jackson, Mississippi – and the time that you were at Lanier knows who Thomas Billups is. And, and now the HBCU ranks in the GCAC is getting a handful from Coach Thomas Billups. And as long as you're at Sugulu, I think you're going to continue to give the GCAC handfuls. And I hope you stay there and win a lot of championships like you did at Lanier. Well, that's, that's my goal is to stay there and win. And, you know, you were talking about football a few minutes ago, uh, and I know you ain't got much time, but I was the offensive coordinator in football at high, in, in Vicksburg High School. We won a, a state championship in football, but I was the offensive coordinator. You know some Coach Billups, during my four years of uh, playing football at Callaway, we always beat up on Lanier. And I'm pretty sure that because you wasn't the head coach. Or all the, were, you, were you on the coaching staff at Lanier in football? Well, yeah, I coached I coached at Lanier for about uh, – about, three years in football. So I I, I kind of let it, you know, let it go because I wanted to 
focus you know, on basketball. <laughs> most of my time go into basketball. So, but I'm pretty sure if you had coached and one, in, one, in football, Lanier would have had well, more success on that football field with your teachings. Yeah, but let me just tell you this here: when we was at when I did, at Lanier, they was gonna hire my son-in-law, Chris Jones, and they asked me. My principal asked me would I go out and do spring training for football. And I told her, yeah, because I, you know, I thought they was going to hire him, and they said they was going to hire him, mm-hmm. but he just couldn't get down there at the time because he had to finish the school year uh, uh, where he was. Right. Uh, Lanier used to didn't have but about probably about 35 people, 35 or 40 kids out for football. I went out and did spring training. I had 75 kids out. And Lanier's doing better in football, too. Yeah, and that's my homeboy for, uh, that's coaching over there now. Now, yes, indeed. Yeah. Well, coach, we gonna. And I want to say this one. Yeah, I want to say this before we get off. One All more right. thing, and I'm gonna, you know, I, our HBCUs like Jackson State Valley, Alcorn, and you know, uh, Texas Southern, Prairie View. Uh, I don't know what they're doing in Texas, but I'm talking about the, in the state of Mississippi. Uh, you know. Just what you said a few minutes ago about giving people a chance that know what they're doing, uh, and they say you got to have college experience. Uh, man, I can tell you, I show uh, respect all corn because the football coach that played there, mm-hmm. they gave him a chance, and look what this look what he's doing, right. And, but, you know, and that's what our black school got to do. We got to give our coaches a that play of that played there. We got to give these guys a chance to, you know, because we played there. We played our heart out. Give us a chance, you know. And it's it just like the, the next man. If you don't win in three years, you get rid of us. But give us a chance. We could do better than what they had there. I, I know I can. I know I know you can too. I'm, I I want to know who the eighty was who didn't give you a chance. I want to find out and be like <laughs> get the alumni on them. Like why didn't you hire Coach Thomas Billy? You know how many swag championships we could have possibly had with this man leading us. You know his name alone breeds winning. And, and, and Coach, I want to thank you for yeah. calling in. I got your cell phone number. I'm gonna definitely give yeah. you a call. And, we can talk talk about some things and conversate. And, and look, don't get me wrong. Now, people out there that listen, don't get me wrong. I'm not upset about they didn't hire me. Uh-huh. I'm not upset about that because hey, that's that's their job is to hire who they want. Uh, hey, I'm just happy and God done blessed me for what I done done, and I'm I'm so glad that that He put me in this position to to be a winner. Yes, and indeed. like I said, I'm not mad at them, but it's not my loss; it's their loss. I agree with that. So, have a good night, Coach. Okay, I appreciate you uh, calling in. I mean, for me, let me talk on your show, man. Oh, most definitely. I I got your cell phone number. We're going to chop it up later, Coach. Okay, all right. I appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you, Coach. All right, bye-bye. Good night, Coach. Kels. PP. Yeah. PP, I'm PP. I got like, with you being from the Delta. Did you know Coach Thomas Billups' a resume as a basketball coach? Man, I'm upset that. What is it? You know, we know our best coach jumped straight from uh, being a legend in high school straight yes. to Valley, and exactly. look what he did. Yeah. That's what. That's what got me upset right now. Yeah, you're right. Coach Lafayette Striven jumped from high school to Valley, finished up his coaching career at Tougaloo, as well as Coach Harvey Wardell. Kels, we're about out of time. You got anything you want to wrap us up with, close us out with? I don't. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we want to thank Coach Thomas Billups, head coach of Tougaloo College mm-hmm. Basketball, for being a guest on Black College Experience. Um, it's Christmas season. We're about nine days away from Santa Claus visiting. And then, of course, I want to make sure everyone knows that uh, it's the it's the reason season to give. So uh, on this note, 
Derek Thomas, Keisha Cater for Black Hard Experience. Make sure you check in with us next week for another episode of Black Hard Experience. That's it. Peace it's out, It's Christmas everybody. season. Oh. It's Christmas season, so we won't be here next week. Well, well, we won't be here next well, week. We'll see y'all. Be, yeah, it's 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 because it's it's travel season for me. So, so I'm gonna be getting up out of Georgia pretty soon. So yeah, it, so we'll I won't be yeah, back next after week, New we'll. Year. Be back after New Year. Be back after New Year, ladies and gentlemen. So you know, be checking our pages. We'll still be posting links for Black College Experience Sports Action. We'll be back. After the new year uh, for our, the first episode of Black Hot Experience in 2019. Peace out, everybody. Good night.